Invincible Season 2 is absolutely amazing, except for the part that he's with Amber, but that's a work in progress. Invincible is everything the modern MCU isn't. After an incredibly strong Season 1 that set the ball rolling, the new season hasn't been putting any punches either. Its bold and fresh take on the genre, along with its incredible writing and twists, have made it an instant classic. When you compare it to what the MCU has been pumping out recently, the difference in quality is clear. Flop after flop after flop has proven they just- Would you say that Invincible has twists? I don't think Invincible has twists, honestly. I think Invincible just does a really good job at highlighting wrong decisions and how one decision can lead to a, a negative outcome and how negative things can lead towards bigger negative things and how indecisiveness can lead to negative things. Invincible pretty much is a story about people wanting to kind of do right, but it leads to bad and bad things happen in general. And that's what makes it really good because that's real life. A lot of bad things happen in real life can't learn that lesson. And if it keeps on carrying like this, Invincible is going to destroy the MCU. Watching DC and Marvel films alone would make you think that the superhero genre is on its last legs. Oh, Same geez. stories over and over again with awful characters and even worse writing is getting to even the most hardcore of Marvel fans by now. So what's Invincible done differently? On the surface, Invincible might look like any other superhero property. Tons of the characters are clearly borrowed versions of other famous heroes. Omni-Man is clearly inspired by Superman. Darkwing is a counterpart to Batman. Monster Girl and her transformation power is obviously drawing from the Hulk. Along with the characters, the world is clearly drawing from superhero tropes as well. Cecil and the Global Defense Agency fill in for the shadowy government agency putting the strings from behind the scenes. All the heroes have their own secret identities as well. If you can name a superhero trope, it's probably in there. The difference comes with what Invincible and its writers have actually done with these archetypes and characters. All the ingredients for a light-hearted fun comic book show are there. And the first episode makes you think that's all it's going to be. With this cheerful version of the Justice League facing off against two cartoonishly simple and outmatched villains. That is until its infamous ending. Mix R-rated violence and- Are we sure about that? Because I don't remember the first episode perfectly, but- Already from just this shot, this uh, this thing happening in episode 1, you could already tell, wait a minute, this is gonna be different. This is gonna be way different with Omni-Man. When the, when the moment he makes his appearance, you understand that this is not just another Justice League ripoff. That this is not Super Friends and Company. That this is something different. That this is something else. Okay? Or was maybe that just me? Who knows, right? Cartoonishly simple and outmatched villains. That is until its infamous ending. Mixed R-rated violence and colorful comic book superheroes isn't completely unique, but the execution is incredible. The final scene from Hello. episode one is a masterclass in how to shock the audience and give weight to what's happening. The music is also particularly impressive, starting out in usual Marvel fashion with an ominous orchestral swell. As the fight continues, it keeps building just as expected. But once Omni-Man makes the first kill, it completely cuts out, leaving the audience alone as the carnage unfolds. It's this scene that illuminates one of Invincible's greatest strengths and something that's clearly missing from the modern MCU, unpredictability and actual stakes. It shows the audience that nobody's safe. Characters which are introduced as the top heroes of the world get dispatched one by one. While it's obviously animated and cartoonish, the violence is realistic in its speed and its impact. It tells us that anyone could go at any time. Nobody is safe and real. Tangible True. danger is always around the corner. And the whole show keeps this tension going expertly. An often underrated scene is when Omniman goes to see his tailor, Art. Without any overt threats or menace, the point comes through incredibly clearly. Omniman simply flicking the top of a beer bottle is all Omniman needs to demonstrate the fact that he could end Art's life in a split second. It stands in stark contrast to the post endgame MCU, but you already know pretty much everything Disgusting. that's going to happen before the movie even starts. The main characters will be safe at the end, they always win eventually. The fights will be visual spectacle, sure. Visual spectacles? I don't know Brooklyn. about that one, Chief. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know if I want, want to call the Marvels a vis visual spectacle, okay? The visuals in Marvel movies have been steadily but surely going downhill at a rapid race, uh, race, rate. Anyone remember Ant-Man and uh, Wasp or whatever it's called? The Quantum Mania verse thing with smart ants? Yeah, the, the visuals there were disgusting, they were eye-bleeding, they weren't good. They were large, colorful, and painful for no reason. And where they needed to be good, 
they were horrible. Okay, the spectacle of the MCU is gone. And the spectacle of the MCU in the first place was never really there in, to begin with. Yeah, sure, Endgame added spectacle. True. True. And, you know, other movies also obviously had some spectacle. But it was relatively contained. It was just like one big explosion, not world-shattering explosion-esque type of thing. You know, except Guardians of the Galaxy, I guess. But that's slightly different, right? It was different. It, it was definitely different. And they had, they just had good stories. You, even at the start of the MCU, you knew that, well, the I, I, Iron Man's not gonna fail. Tony Stark's not gonna die. Captain America is not gonna die. But, but, even though if, even though we understood that 100% perfectly, that was not a dull moment because you were interested in their story, how things are going to happen, what's going to happen, how it's going to happen. And that was enough. In Invincible, you're interested in what's going to happen, why it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. And the characters are not safe. Anyone's face could be smashed in at any time and there's no guarantee they survive, okay? It's really good with that never have the impact that Invincible can accomplish with just a few frames of animation. They're simply roller coasters. The ride might be fun the first few times, but MCU films always end up right back at the start, ready to make the same twists and turns all over again. It's a formula they've been milking for nearly two decades, but over that time, the characters like Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America that drew people in have nearly all gone. In their stead is a collection of former side characters who, despite their actors' best efforts, just don't cut it as a main attraction. That, or they use movies to try and force through a political message. Before when the MCU still packed a punch, these were nuanced discussions. Throw. The Russo brothers and their two Captain America movies had these layers. The Winter Soldier and Civil War was a story about Captain America defeating a shadowy organization and facing his past. Underneath that though, there was a real discussion about government and the middle ground between safety and control. Throw. How much freedom do you trade away for that? And how can you trust those in power to know the responsibility that comes with that? These were yeah, the plot essentially had meaning. Crazy, I know. Nowadays, the plot doesn't have meaning. Nowadays, the plot is just, Oh, look at that random goofy thing that just happened over there. Isn't that random and goofy? That's the best they can accomplish nowadays. It is sad and pitiful, honestly. For the questions the movie was posing. Sure, you might be able to trust a perfect person to operate without rules for the good of everyone. But even Captain America wasn't perfect and the Avengers Authority was in conflict with the actual rules that everyone else lives by. People still disagree about whether Iron Man was right or if Captain America was justified. But as the MCU progressed, these discussions melted away, replaced by what boardroom executives think the audience wants to see. At first, it was just a few scenes, like the infamous She's Got Help part from the final battle of Endgame. Don't worry. Yeah. She's got help. It was ridiculous in its execution, getting pretty much- I mean- no one al almost knows what's, by the way, happening here. Why is she important? Oh, no. Wh wh why is she important? I, I don't know. When did she even get an Iron Man suit? Did I miss something? I probably missed something. Uh, at least Valkyrie's right there at the back of the bus, honestly, at this point. Because that would be even worse if she was front dead and being like, Hey, hey I'm really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like... Really, really powerful god, god tier, honestly, almost. Yeah, that would be really, really sad and bad. You got, you got Wanda, the Scarlet Witch, who technically could just snap her fingers and destroy everything, and... Why? Sh she shouldn't even be here because the fight's too easy with her, right? And, and she's the only character that makes sense here. It was ridiculous in its execution getting pretty much every single female character to pose for the camera. Oh yeah, look at this one. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> I made an adamantium detector from scratch. It detects adamantium, but I never tested it because I never found any adamantium. Uh, uh, it's so stupid. Yeah, the, the reason this didn't work is because half the characters here are hated. Except Mantis and again, Scarlet Witch, but you know... That's not a lot of characters, okay? That's that's only two good characters between absolute garbage. Camera and wow the audience with their presence. This scene became the template for entire movies like the Marvels, which was- Oh, and Gamora appears there at the very, very last split second of the shot, which is- Why wasn't she front and center in that case, huh? 
clearly predictably a failure. Instead of just owning their status as a popcorn film, or going deeper and actually trying to start a conversation, these movies rely on something else entirely. A mixture of identity politics, omnipotent strong female characters, and a world that changes to accommodate them rather than the other way around. The main hero starts out Hello. as the most competent, powerful people in their little world. The rest of the movie is just the other characters slowly coming to realize it. Watching Invincible only drives this- Oh yeah. The main character? It's so boring. There's- there's no problems. Modern Marvel is just- okay, here- here's your strong female protagonist. She's perfect, she's strong, she's flawless. Uh, guess what happens through the movie? Uh, that's right, she- nothing gets introduced that can even rival her. I don't even understand how these movies are honestly- uh, can- can even be made with this structure. How do you in make a movie about a character and throughout the movie this character has no flaws. They have never been even put in a remotely complicated position. Because it doesn't exist. There's nothing that can stand against them. How is a movie supposed to feel interesting if you don't even have the illusion of stakes being uh, being put on the floor, okay? I don't know. Well, but they do it. They do it constantly. And that's kind of crazy. And it's, it's exactly as he says. The world just slowly begins to understand that this character is perfect, uh, uh, unabsolutely fi uh, de defiable in any way, and can't do anything wrong, and the world should accept and mold itself around it. That's stupid. That's boring. That's very annoying also went deeper, but not for the reason you might expect. When the first season released, barely anyone had anything bad to say about it. It was except for the character of Amber, Mark's girlfriend. Obviously. Over the course of the show, they constantly drive it in that she's just the best person that's ever existed. Countless times they show her talking about or doing charity work. Yeah. Helping build schools. It was one of those group volunteer things. Meanwhile, Mark is trying to balance his hero life with his normal life, and he constantly stands her up without telling her why. Amber's rightfully annoyed, and they go through the classic teenage romance drama because of it. Still, the entire Boring. world seems to think she's always right, despite the fact that she barely shows any sympathy when she's told Mark was hit by a bus. All of this comes to a head when everybody's attacked on a trip to a college. Mark runs off to change into Invincible. Then he saves their lives. But to Amber, it just looks like he left them for dead. You can understand why. No, it's actually Burst. She knows. I, I'm not sure how long she's supposed to uh, know that he's invincible, but she knows for a very long time. Okay? And when she says you, you, it's more important to, to be at the soup kitchen than saving hundreds of lives uh, in some kind of uh, situation, she, she means that, you know, her soup kitchen duties save more lives or something like that. She's absolutely insane. Everyone hates her. For good reason, because she is the Marvel protagonist. Why she breaks up with him after that, not knowing the truth. The problem comes later when they reveal that she'd known he was a superhero for weeks. She still blamed him for not going out on dates with her, even when she knows that Mark is risking his life to save other people. Then after the finale, she just walks back into Mark's arms, like he was in the wrong the entire time. It's like they added a tiny bit of the modern MCU into Invincible, yep. and the treatment of her character is one of the only criticisms you can really level at the show. But what we've seen in season two so far gives us a reason to keep hoping. Clearly. And by the way, this also at the same time proves that people are not just randomly hating on, you know, because it's a popular thing in the media. Oh, you don't like Miss Marvel because she's a girl. No, we, we hate her because she's horribly written and not likable in the even slightest bit of ways, okay? And Invincible proves it. Every other female character is really liked for a lot of reasons. Except Amber. Except Amber, because she is exactly the same uh, type of character as what you would get in any Marvel movie currently. So it makes perfect sense. The writers listened to the feedback they got and did some rethinking. As her character completely changes, she accepts Mark's responsibilities, and they outweigh her own needs. She's supportive and kind, a complete reversal of her antics in season one. It might have been a little more satisfying to see Mark actually confront her and I mean, yeah, she has changed that in season two now, that is for sure. But, I mean, I'm still there watching every episode, crossing my fingers and saying, please, Amber, get hit by a line of buses 
unrecoverable, get atomically wasted and devastated, I hate you that much. Stand up for himself, but it's not a huge issue. And it shows that the writers and the showrunners are willing to listen to the fans and the audience. They know that they messed up a character before, and there are scenes that seem like they're specifically meant to fix those issues. It's completely the opposite of what the MCU has been doing. Time and time again, they've been making the same sorts of inconsistent, poorly written movies, appealing to an audience that just doesn't exist outside of the I would say that they have been remarkably consistent in making bad movies, though. Yeah, I would definitely say if there's one thing Marvel does right and consistent, it's being bad at doing what they are currently doing. And a lot of it. Because they don't, they don't learn. They make one bad woke movie, and there they are, off to the races, making another one. Do they learn from the mistakes? No. They they repeat it they repeat them and they tend to even repeat them harder some magically. How? Man, life life is a struggle, huh? minds of executives. There are some forces outside of their control working against them, of course. Invincible's production timeline is much shorter than your average $300 million Marvel production. There's years in between the script getting True. written and the final film actually coming out. They might know now that diversity fodder and pandering films aren't really working anymore, but it won't change the films they've pretty much made already. Even with this incredibly generous view of it all though, they're still obviously forcing something that anyone should know doesn't work. The 2016 Ghostbusters remake should have been all oh, the information geez. they need to know that gender swapping the characters, throwing in some girl power scenes, and releasing the film isn't enough to make people like it. Ghostbusters 2016 was quite literally the perfect storm of everything that people hate about modern Hollywood. It looks embarrassing when you compare it to the original that was made 30 years ago, and that still holds up. The effects in that movie are still amazing after all this time. The fact that they're still doing it nearly a decade later shows how out of touch the MCU, Disney, and their executives truly are. Invincible shows us how to write characters properly, not based on glorifying whatever checkbox their identity fits into, but actually treating them like a real person. A perfect example is Debbie, Omni-Man's wife and Mark's son. One difference between her and- Yeah, by the way, Debbie is a great character because by all accounts, you technically should kind of dislike her. If someone gave you a broad overview of what Debbie's character is, it would probably come off to someone who has never seen the show as she's kind of unlikable most likely or that she's you know mid-ish average-ish right but debbie is a great character that no one complains about because she is relatable with you understand what she does why she does it what she accepts what she doesn't accept what her problems are and what her well fears and whatnot is you can easily relate to it and understand it Cookie Carter's strong female protagonist archetype is that she actually has agency. She's her own person with her own nuanced personality. When her doubts are raised, she investigates Nolan herself. She gets the truth herself, and then she's left to deal with the consequences. She's strong, but not in some better than every other single character way, but in a down-to-worth realistic way. She's not even strong, she's just not stupid. That that's it. That that's it. It's nothing more complicated than that. She's just not stupid and a normal human. That's it. Nola might be one of the strongest people on the planet physically, but Debbie is clearly stronger emotionally. In the end, it overcomes Nolan's physical strength. Her impact on Mark is what saves the world. And when Nolan is trying to convince Mark to help him, it's his comment that she's like a pet that sets him over the edge and convinces him to resist. It's a perfect example of the kind of writing that just isn't present in the MCU anymore. It lays the foundations for dark and dramatic moments that aren't constantly being undercut by jokes. In fact, Invincible even cuts away from the action towards the end of the finale to add more character development, to set the stage for the internal conflict that's driving them. It's like the opposite of what the MCU would have done in a similar scene. The show even subtly makes fun of the way every superhero becomes a one-line comedian. In the MCU, these moments used to be refreshing break, but now they're so common that they make it seem like nobody's taking anything seriously. Now might be a really good time for you to get angry. That's my secret, Captain. I'm always angry. How is the audience meant to get invested in the big CGI fight when the characters aren't? Inserting that into Invincible would just be ridiculous. Like if Omniman made a pun about missing his stop during the train scene. Invincible proves that superhero fatigue isn't a real thing. In fact, people are as excited as ever to see more of these stories, but only if they're done right. The real issue with- Yeah, I don't think any kind of fatigue is actually real. I think it's just, you know, you get more of the same and everything becomes slowly but surely verged done over time and people just get bored of it because it's badly done. 
if it keeps being done well, then I don't think anyone cares. With the MCU, and the reason everybody got tired of it runs much deeper. Its success was its downfall. People got invested into the main characters, the main plotline, and the overarching arc with Thanos. It's like they're just trying to figure out where to go next. Iron Man, the hero who started it all, is gone now as well as Captain America. Thor stayed on for a while, but he couldn't even carry his own Jesus Phase 4 joke. film. The next big villain hasn't really come into it at all. They didn't need another Thanos, of course. King is a joke. How can you be scared of a villain that has already lost 15 times and one of the times is against giant ants and Ant-Man? I mean, okay, there's, there's losing and then there's losing against Ant-Man. Not good. Not good at all. But a reason to care about the movie outside of whatever contrived stakes they set up is key. The MCU is just confused now. It lost all the momentum that made Infinity War and Endgame such massive events. The motivation got drowned in a sea of mediocre spin off shows, side characters, and simply poor movies. On top of all of that, each Marvel film used to stand on its own. Their connection. I mean, She Hulk is legendarily bad, so you know, it is what it is. With the rest of the MCU was subtle, sometimes completely relegated to the end credit scene. Now, watching a modern Marvel film feels like starting a movie two thirds of the way through. They're so reliant on the other films for their reason to exist, whilst also not contributing to any actual overarching plot in a clear, noticeable way. The comics and the actual source material have ceased to matter entirely, replaced by whatever boardroom of executives decide will play well to focus groups. Invincible doesn't have this problem. The story is all set out, and it's gonna get crazy. Every scene and episode matters because it moves the story forward. The stakes in the universe seem real because the characters seem real. It's even going to do the multiverse angle better. Starting with Endgame, the multiverse becomes the ultimate cop-out for the writers. Instead yep. of actually mattering for the plot, it's- South Park said this so well. Multiverses are lame. Well, the truth is multiverses are not lame. It's just how Marvel handles them is lame. Because it's true, they are cop-outs. Because of the multiverse, nothing kind of really matters at all. Even in Rick and Morty, the universes matter more. It's just a one-stop shop to fix the plot of a movie. Or it's just used to push in cameos from other superheroes that wouldn't fit otherwise. Cameos that don't just mean nothing, but actually undermine the characters themselves. For anyone who likes the Fantastic Four and Mr. Fantastic himself, his cameo in the Doctor Strange movie must have been so disappointing. He teleports in, gets called the smartest man alive, reveals his friend's powers, causing him to instantly die. Then he just dies as well. Scenes like that one that just destroy parts of the Marvel Universe a dime a dozen now. Invincible doesn't have this problem though. It doesn't have to rely on cheap nostalgia and recognition to give way to its stories. It obviously borrows tropes and archetypes from superhero comics, but it builds on them and turns them into something new. The first episode is a great example, as we see the status quo of the Justice League protecting the Earth from cartoonish villains. A world where the heroes and the villains fight, the heroes win and then everything just goes back to normal. Then that all gets thrown on its head in one final scene. All the work the episode did in setting up those characters gets violently destroyed. We see the consequences every time something happens. The characters go through loss, regret, and every other emotion as the world changes around them. Even Omniman isn't impervious to it. When Mark gets his powers, he's distressed because it means he's run out of time. The world and the family he built are over now. He's caught between Viltrum and Earth. If Mark hadn't gotten his powers, he could have waited until his family had passed away, then gotten on with his mission. Instead, he's got to tear them apart. This focus on consequences and keeping one foot in reality is what sets Invincible apart and makes every fight and conversation matter so much more. Which other superhero show has so many scenes that take place in hospitals? Any characters could die, nobody is safe. Even Mark, despite being the main character and actually being called invincible, is a punching bag more often than not. True. But each fight makes him learn another lesson and pushes his character forward towards a concrete conclusion. It isn't like the MCU, which is based around a sitcom style of- Do Mark's fights actually make him learn something about stuff and push him forward? I'm not sure with that. It's just the fact that the uh, Viltrumites are, you know, the, the same as Scions. Sa Scions. Saiyans, Scions, wow, what the hell. Anyway, they're, they're the same in the in the sense that get beaten to death, come back stronger. Bam, then you, there you go, a zen boost. The storytelling. There's no constant cycle where every episode and plotline ends with everything going back to the way things were. Just as superhero comics progress towards this way of structuring a story, comic book films and shows are catching up as well. Superheroes aren't a dying breed like some people would think after seeing the MCU's collapse. They said the genre is changing and evolving into something better, with shows like Invincible and The Boys leading the way. Meanwhile, the MCU is shooting itself in the foot. It was expected that there would be some kind of drop-off after Endgame, 
without all the famous characters that built it all. But even then, the performances True? were truly dismal. Every single aspect of the film. Uh, truly dismal. I think he's trying to be nice here. It's not truly dismal. It's beyond redemption at this point. Films has gotten worse. Special effects are even down the drain. Just look at Thor: Love and Thunder. Despite working Stop. their VFX artists down to the bone for years on end, they've barely got anything to show for it. Sometimes artists were given just weeks to create a complete scene. A crazy task, considering the whole movie is pretty much filmed on a green screen anyway. In the 2700. Yeah, green screen is just too much now. Everything's on the green screen. Special effects are just down the drain. It's it's pretty atrocious, I'm not gonna lie. Practical effects have withstood the test of time because, well, they're practical effects, and if you make them good, congratulations. They will withstand the test of time. The thing, Jurassic Park. I I forgot the other, uh, the other big one that was mentioned already here somewhere. Well, you know. There, there are there are great movies that would stand the test of time because of practical effects. But Marvel, uh, full green screen, it's so boring. Feels uninspired, really. ...shots that make up Infinity War, only 80 didn't have VFX in them. Like most of the problems with Marvel, it's a result of corporate greed on the part of Disney. Despite raking in untold billions from these movies, they're still understaffing artists and forcing them into permanent crunch time. As their films perform worse and worse, there will be even less money in the budget and the effects will only get worse. Then there's all the long shows that barely anyone watches. One Division, for example, had more VFX shots and work than the entirety of Endgame. Marvel keeps throwing more stuff at the wall, hoping it will stick, but every time they do, they just make the problem worse. Saving money by hiring amateur writers and directors isn't helping either. It's a problem that extends across the whole production, and it's been going on for years now. Remember how the writer's strike didn't change a single thing? I do. Why did it stop? If it didn't change the quality of the shows. And it's pretty hopeless that we'll see a transition back towards quality anytime soon. The Boys and Invincible dodge this problem in different ways. The Boys places tons of emphasis on physical effects. Invincible is animated, so it's a completely different story. But they don't get bogged down in multiple movies, TV shows, and properties. Invincible is animated, but it's animated well also. There would be there are there are tons of shows already that exist that are similar to Invincible, but their animation is fifty percent less because they they take less frames. If Invincible's animation is honestly pretty good, very good. It's all coming out at once. When spin-offs do come out, like Gen V or the Atom Eve episode, they only build on previous success rather than taking away from it. And by focusing on quality over quantity, Invincible is showing people what the genre can really be. It's given people a breath of fresh air and it's destroying the MCU. True. Anyway, that that was Moon. Pretty good stuff, not gonna lie. Anyway, this was also Quizzer Sensei. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and already and have a nice day. Bye bye.